read. So it's afternoon here in downtown Binghamton. And this is Yvonne DeVita from Smart Conversations. And regular viewers know I don't live in Binghamton. I live in Shenango Bridge, but it's just a hop and skip and a jump from Binghamton. And guess what? We got out with the dog early today because it isn't raining yet. And the power hasn't gone out yet. That's life in Binghamton. Not at all like it used to be when I lived in Colorado. And still, I do love being here. Today on Smart Conversations, I have a really special guest. Her name is Jay Miller. Jay, welcome to the show. Thank you. And I want everyone to kind of think about, think about something that you wished you could do to help other people, but you haven't done anything because you, you were like, you didn't know how. How do I do that? I mean, when we, myself, my husband, my daughter, and, and Caroline started Blog Paws way back, more than 10 years ago now, folks, we didn't know what we were doing either. But we knew we wanted to help pet bloggers. We knew we wanted to help pets. And so we started this little community and we grew it into something called Blog Paws. And that's something that is, is near and dear to my heart. So if you've ever thought about doing something like that, maybe this is a good show for you today because my guest, Jay, is doing something that I found out about through her newsletter. And I said to myself, she has to be on the show. So before we get to that, let me tell you more about her. And here we are. Sounds to me, Jay, like you're writing a book called Brick by Brick. Is that true? Eventually, yes. Mm -hmm. I like that part. I like that part. Brick by Brick, how a junior hedge fund manager created an investment vehicle that moved the needle in eradicating poverty and other titles partly written for publication following the next two real estate developments. That's what she shared with me. Sounds wonderful, sounds wonderful. She is the founder and business relationship strategist for Haven Partners Group, a property holding company based in the US that offers three proven profiting models on 15 plus acre properties with housing for active seniors, excursion guests and private conferences. Hmm, I, I'm really intrigued by that. The ensemble trifecta scales from within a private performance-based fund. All will be providing rustic backdrops for adventures, learning, professional development, as well as fun, including a profiting animal rescue where pampered athletic animal residents of an on-site sanctuary's venture out for land clearing assignments that prevent fires, reduce crime, regenerate soil, and eliminate invasive vegetation. That's a big mouthful, but we'll talk a little bit about that. Jay is a speaker, author, consult, human and animal rights advocate, vegan, though not a radical vegan. She served as a Power Shift ambassador for Damon John's book, Power Shift, from a faith perspective, Jay has fueled the resolve that wealth building and prospering via service is both biblical and embraced by many more of the wealthy than most of us are aware of. Six near-death experiences have been a factor in determining we all have irreplaceable purposes. Jay, I'm gonna I'm gonna stop there because that is really, I mean, the whole package there that I just talked about, it does sum you up in a nice little kind of package, sort of. But the mystery of six near-death experiences and being vegan, but not radically so. Talk a little bit about the Jay that is today compared to before that all happened? Well, it's like a transformation that you had not planned on. Mm -hmm. It's like, I feel like God has a sense of humor 
whoever you thought you were becoming, you know, when, when you, God, when you have plans, God, you know, has other plans. Yeah. Yeah. And so it's like, it's like suddenly overnight you get up one day and you look in the mirror and you don't recognize who is in the mirror based on who you thought you were. And, and you have, you know, your past is the past and you move with, move on with what you've got. And I just, I'm grateful and fortunate that I woke up twice in a hospital room, not thinking I was going to wake up. And that's, you know, that's, those are the scariest ones, but the yeah. others were, you know, pers I am grateful for what I've survived that other people do not. And I become very aware of everything that happened along that journey that could have gone wrong that did not. And that's what I'm grateful for. And that's what I want to instill in people, you know, there's always something that could go wrong on the highway. It's not you, it's another driver. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. it's the will of God, or you're, you have something left to do here, which is why you're still here. And that's for everyone. So as far as that concept, I mean, I really believe you're right, that we all have something to do. I believe that we're all given talents and, um, if we can learn how to use them and if we can learn to accept them and if we can not constantly think of ourselves as less than, that makes us more likely to be this, this thing that people like to call a success, okay? I mean, success is such a, it, it's such a term that you can be a success without being rich and famous and on TV all the time. There are successful people all over, right? I mean, Absolutely. yeah, you, you, you and I, I'm a little well known on the internet because of blog pause, the, the influencer uh, pet blogger community that I, I was part of. But other than that, I'm just little me, but I still think I'm a success. Absolutely. I mean, there are a lot of people who are very successful, very famous, I mean, in their own circles and very wealthy that don't want to be visible. They can uh -huh. do more that way. They can move faster that way when there's not a camera on them or there's not someone highlighting them or following them with a camera or you don't I mean there's a whole other world out there because we are so shaped by the media mm. but the real players and they're a lot of them are really really good people doing great things they move faster with their own kind with the kind of crowd that you attract doing what they do serving their purpose and what is gratifying to me is the stars are the people on the ground actually making these things happen in a very visible way, but they might be funded by someone who wants to remain anonymous, but it gives them the satisfaction for themselves and their families that they're contributing to things that both make a difference, but are also profitable. Right. So tell me about um, your animal rights um, focus, because that was how I really got interested in talking with you. Tell us a little more about that. Well, animals are sentient beings. Yep. And during the pandemic in particular, I'm sure I obviously I'm not the not the first person to say how their people's pets in isolation kept them sane. Mm -hmm. They certainly did me. And so, I mean, that's just one example. They like they are put on the planet not to be our food necessarily. They can be but that's, that's not their main purpose. They're here to serve us. They operate the way they operate on instinct alone. Humans can, we, we humans can screw ourselves up because we have too many choices. Mm -hmm. Animals survive on instinct. There's lots we can learn from animals in how they love and how they take care of their own and how they instinctually know how to know their part in the food chain, if you will, in, in how they operate in their, in their ecosystems. But we really haven't, have a lot to learn from still yeah. that scientists are just starting to study. Right. And the pandemic was kind of like a catalyst for this, ironically, into yeah. how that ecosystem works with animals and all the people that are now going to plant-based because of the hazards of humans abusing animals or shifting the balance too far in the wrong direction mm -hmm. as to how we are to coexist. I, I really think that's pretty, pretty profound because there are so many people who, for want of the best education or, or, or want of training or learning, still look at animals as less than when, in my perspective, 
animals provide so much benefit. Uh, and, and I don't want to talk about the, the food chain because I'm not a vegan, but I have cut back and I am very much aware of how the animals are treated, whose, whose food I may be consuming. And in the end, every, it's, it's astonishing the things we learned at blog pause. So here, here it is the 2000s. And when I grew up in the 1950s, a dog was just a dog. A cat was just a cat. You, you didn't go to the, buy special food for them. You, you didn't take them to the vet more than to get a rabies shot. That was all they got was a rabies shot. And today they're actually literally parts of the family and have taught us some of the things that we should have known that maybe we knew way back in the caveman days about, like you said, about love, about unconditional love. They don't care who you are. They don't care what you look like. They don't even care how you smell. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, uh, and the type of animals. So people would come to blog paws and bring guinea pigs and hamsters and um, birds. And these were not the traditional animals that you would think of as creating a bond with a human being, but they do. They have their own personalities, every single one of them. And, and so one. do lizards. Yeah, from what I understand. <laughs> so tell me about the fundraiser that I read about in your newsletter. Tell me why you, you started that and what that's all about. Okay, so like, as you described, I have this long term plan to create sanctuaries on every single property, but I became very concerned with this is a wonderful thing that's taking shape here, but it's not. And when I, I transferred from New York City to North Florida to set this up, and there's a lot to do. And I was working for a rescuer as a volunteer in New York, and it's like the mafia. It's like once you're involved with the rescue, you can't get out, or someone else keeps pulling you into this and that emergency that's local. Right. And I and I love that, but I was doing it for nothing, and I, you know, I loved it. But I, the whole purpose was in, improving the quality of lives of seniors and animals, and that symbiosis with having offering animal therapy and things like that. But I'm like. There's this thing happening now with the animals being returned to shelters with um, farm animals being euthanized because of the meat demand going down. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, what can I do now? What can I do right now? There's gotta be something I can do right now. And I was sent this link about animal transport companies. And I didn't really know that there were formal animal transport companies mm -hmm. that you know take animals from one place to another. And they also do double duty as like, uh, home goods or equipment or whatever. They're just transport companies with a focus on animals. Some contractors, independent contractors do only that. And a lot of them, from what I can tell, they work in silos and they're not cheap. And there's this, you know, when you send an animal freight in an airplane, even though you might pay a big price tag, that animal is traumatized. There's no temperature control within the cargo area. They're not handled well. You don't know what kind of shape your traumatized animal is gonna be and when, when it arrives, if it survives. And like you have to sign an insurance waiver that if your animal dies, the airline is not liable and you, you know, all this stuff. Nobody wants to do that, even high ticket. Right. So that's why so many of these transport companies exist. But there's no, there's no safety net for someone that has an emergency to a vet or there's an animal that's been distressed that needs to get to a sanctuary or needs to get to a rescue. And you've probably seen some of these airplane companies that they have a pilot's license and they take rescues, like entire cargo areas of rescues yes. that are well taken care of from a, a, a meat, you know, where they're illegally, illegally in, in another country and bringing them to the States. Well, this is all part of it, you know, that whole picture, but they're not connected to each other. And so I started a fundraiser with this long game nonprofit for that also serves the properties that's not part of the fundraiser that's not described in the fundraiser because it's really targeted to people that have an emergency, they cannot afford 
to transport their pet to a place across the country because they're leaving a metropolitan area to have a better quality of life, maybe to work remotely in another place, but the expense of moving and transporting the animal or, is, or their pets, if there's a number of them, is simply too much for them to afford and they really wanna keep their pets or they have to adopt their animal out willingly or unwillingly mm. or worst case, they're ending up back in the shelters or they're abandoning them. Mm. And enough people care about this sort of thing, we know they were willing to fund these short-term emergency transports for either to support families or get an animal to a rescue or a sanctuary where they otherwise would be neglected or you they call it euthanizing. Put in a, putting a gun to a pig's head is not euthanizing it. Euthanizing is by definition is supposed to be painless. But either way, it's like there's a way of making a connection here so that there's going to be a need for the animals that aren't euthanized. That's why we're having a sanctuary on every property. Mm -hmm. But to just handle these short-term emergencies where the people who do the transporting and charge their fears are paid full price. Plus you can have volunteers as a network in the cities or touch points during, along these routes to come and walk the animals or feed them or go along on a trip if the driver is so low so that the animal gets the attention that they need if it's special needs during a transport, either if it's like a temperamental animal or it's got a medical emergency that you have another person on board to mm -hmm. handle that properly. For example. Mm -hmm. So we, we at Blog Paws, <clears throat> The very first blog pause, I think something like you're describing happened. So the, the pet bloggers discovered we were going to be, was it in Ohio or I think it was. And there was a dog that needed transport from Florida. And so what happened was a whole bunch of people got involved um, helping, so one person would take it 200 miles, and then another person would be there and pick it up and take it another 200, and it did that all the way to the end to take this dog and get it to where it needed to be, and I mean, it was just beautiful. It was just beautiful, but what you're saying and what I'm hearing is even more important because, number one, I would never put my animal on an airplane. Now, there are sp specific um, flights and, and pilots who have small planes that will transport small dog or small amounts uh, of animals um, from one place to another very carefully, not like putting it in the cargo of some big i mean and the horror stories i'm sure you've heard them i'm sure you've heard them. it's it's just how how anyone would even think of doing that i don't know um but that's number one so that we're my husband and i are looking at doing a cross-country trip from here to colorado and then on to california and of course we want to bring our dog the the um the people we know have come to accept that, oh, if you invite Tom and Yvonne, they're bringing their dog. <laughs> so um, very rarely do we not bring her somewhere with us. But I said, that means we have to drive because there's no way she's flying to Colorado. She's 14 years old. I'm not putting her, she's too big to fit under the seat. Um, so, so, and that's no big deal. I'm, I'm up for a, a road trip, but, um, I, I think what I really like what I'm hearing is the recognition today, not just from those of us who love animals, but I'm starting to see it from other people who understand, okay, I am not necessarily an animal person, but you are. And so this makes sense for this to happen. And that's really, really great. And I know that um, a friend of mine, Kathleen Gage, is plant-based. 
So she even goes to the extreme of no animal products whatsoever. And God bless her. I, I, am, I am happy about plant-based. I do some plant-based eating, but I, um, I haven't gone totally plant-based. And my daughter is mostly plant-based. I think she might eat fish, but she, um, no dairy. And part of the reason, I mean, the point I'm trying to get here is part of the reason is because um, not only is it not necessary for, for your health, you don't have to eat animals, um, but it isn't, it's becoming bad for the environment. And, and so Kathleen talks about that a lot. Do you, have you done any research on that or have any thoughts on that? The animals, vegan, plant-based and how it's probably just as well. Well, I mean, there's been a lot out there lately about that factory farming is just creates a lot of waste and how much water it takes to um, manage a cattle farm. And those are just like the, the basic sound bites that are out there of how factory farming and, and animal farming just hurts the environment and how, ma how many natural resources it uses. And never mind what cows are fed that is not their natural. I mean, everybody wants grass fed cows because what cows are normally fed even is, isn't even their normal diet, which makes the meat sick before we even consume it. Right, right. Yeah, and pigs, and um, I mean, pigs are intelligent animals. Mm -hmm, they are. And anyone who says cows don't have feelings, I, I, they do. And all yes, animals uh, have some sort of, of um, emotional bond to something generally. And so, Talk a little bit more about the sanctuary idea, because I'm really interested in that, especially relative to senior citizens and what that all means together, because I'm a senior citizen. And one of the things, again, that, that my husband and I have said that if we ever get to the point where we want to downsize and move to like a senior center or something, it has to be somewhere that takes pets. So many of them don't. It's like, I'm not going there. Why would I go there? And bring my pet. So talk about that a little bit. Um, well, I before the pandemic, it was the intention for every single property to have a sanctuary. Okay. Because it also serves the four-legged, the, the grazers, if you will, are the ones that are going to be going off-site to take care of invasive education. That's how they actually make money. It's a profitable business and they enjoy it. It's like they, they go, they get on the trailer because it's like dogs going to the dog park. They just love going to a different place to go munch on other vegetation and they get very bored at home, uh -huh. you know? And so, but being a sanctuary, you're gonna have, you know, the anonymous drop-offs in, in the middle of the night of mm -hmm. someone just bringing an animal and they need their own specific breed herding and guarding dogs. But we're not, you know, the grazers are the ones that are going to be their own, like earning their own living. And of course, the they cover those services on the properties for free because that's where they live. That's their business base. But it's to raise awareness of the importance of animals, how they serve us, how we serve them, and how the interaction is so therapeutic because it's a resort environment. The properties are large enough for the seniors to be able to have or not have, I mean, I didn't really th think about them being allowed to have pets, pets in their apartments, but of course, why wouldn't they? Mm -hmm. But they have <laughs> access to these animals that don't fit in their apartments, you know, to go commune with the horses or the larger animals. Um, and, and, but it's facilitated by professionals that facilitate animal therapy. It's not just, yes, they can go visit, and but you know, it's, it's done in a, in a way that, that there's no liability, that everybody's safe and, and they're far enough apart so that they exist completely separately because they're both business entities. The senior cares, you know, the senior, the senior residents are active senior living that's run by a company that does that. Mm -hmm. And the business base that for the animals is also its own entity. So, you know, they're far enough. It's, that's why we call it an ensemble trifecta because these businesses have proximity benefits and also the conference center can host an animal, you know, animal science awareness, uh, agriculture awareness, 
artistic awareness, holistic practices, corporate retreats, all those things in this exact same, it's a, it's a mini hotel with a conference center attached that's dedicated to education and professional development. Anyone can book it, a family mm -hmm. reunion, maximum 30 units, but they all work together at, you know, at some point or another, yet they're separate. So it also sounds to me like something that you could get high school kids and junior college kids involved with. I mean, this, it, it's, it's something that could be the wave of the future to take care of, like you said, it's a trifecta and it, it takes care of three things that need to happen that are various because senior citizens today, I mean, we're not what they used to be. My mother at my age, no, she was with a walker already. And, you know, um, we're, not, we're not going quietly into that good night. No, we are not. So I really love the way that you describe that. And of course, having pets in their home, they would have to have pets in their home. And, um, but, but it, it's a bigger community involvement from, from the perspective of, of, as I was listening to you, again, the whole community then becomes partly involved, the children, the high school kids. I mean, there's opportunities for, for um, new careers. Exactly. It's an entrepreneur incubator by default. Yes. And that's where, yeah. That's where, I mean, that's where the nonprofit is going. The um, purpose of the fundraiser is it triages the emergency cases and who needs help immediately. But okay. with, an, with increased donations, we form the nonprofit that serves the ability for those interns and high school students and any kid that's curious to be able to come onto the properties yeah. to learn about these types of opportunities and how they can decide what to do with the rest of your of their lives yeah. and just learn from people actually doing it as professionals. Well, also, I mean, it's it, 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 I, I think about how we, you and I have grown up um, with at the end of the world stories where robots take over and all the big cities are there and there's no trees and kids have, don't even, there aren't even any zoos. So kids don't even know. This is the antithesis to that. This is outdoors. This is getting people firsthand knowledge and connection um, to Mother Earth, the creatures of Mother Earth, each other, right? And so to that point, yes. Yeah, so when we think of new careers and so many careers are being taken over by uh, robots, it's, it's the lament in the business world and um, oh, we're, everybody's losing their job because now robots are, are gonna start serving drinks at bars. Well, then what else is there? Well, there's something. There's something really good, right? Absolutely. There are limits to what AI can do. Well, you know, yes. But, and, and it's fine to let AI do some of that other stuff that isn't necessary for human. Um, I, but my point being that there are now careers coming up that will envelop a whole lot more of the human condition and the human spirit, as opposed to just, oh, finding a job. I mean, these are careers you're talking about building. Talk, talk about and there's a and there's things that humans can do that AI cannot. There's things that AI can do better than humans. Mm -hmm. And so this is really bringing out the natural talents of individuals and their gifts so that they have more opportunities to explore what they're good at, good at and not being fitting into a corporate box or into a, a job description. That's liberating. Mm -hmm. We're going through um, a crisis, like crisis meaning big change. Mm -hmm. Crisis isn't always bad. Crisis is change that's forced upon us. We have to adapt too quickly. Mm -hmm. And because this technology is advancing faster than us humans can keep up with it, but yet we can be in control and we have to band together 
to, to inform each other of that we actually, to give others, to give themselves permission to be able to exercise those talents because there are these mental structures and, and mental societal constructs that makes it make us limit ourselves because of the old systems that we grew up in that are becoming illusions. Yes, yes, the old systems, yes. I, and, I, and I think that the opportunity to give our children this, this benefit of what you're talking about with these sanctuaries and how they work, because those children will probably live even longer than we do. I mean, I know that there are stories about how uh, the long life is, is less now than it was, but I'm not seeing it. I'm seeing a lot of my friends that are just as vibrant and whatnot at, at um, 65 and 70 as, as they were at 55 and they're not living a shorter life. And the children can work outside, be part of something bigger than themselves, serve mother earth, serve humanity, have a career, make enough of a living to be successful, um, and not have to worry about robots taking over the world. Or, and, and, or mm -hmm. apply that technology so they don't have to work so hard with their physical labor to maximize the benefits and the profits and the product and the productivity. Yes. Oh, that's huge. Yes. And that's exactly where we should be going as a, as a species. And so do you see this, the possibility of the, the dream being across the United States in, in almost every state or these sanctuaries? Well, it is a global it, one. The one that has the sanctuary is an actual franchise. That it's the only franchise of its kind in the world. Mm. So it's an international franchise. And that's a good question. And we're doing these in seasonless locations. Okay. So that, you know, seniors, you know, they gravitate, they gravitate to Florida because the, you know, the, 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 the climate is, is mm -hmm. milder and easier to live in, but there are people that prefer seasons. Yeah. So we're going to license this model once there are a few locations up and running to other seasoned climates. Uh, ironically, in Florida, when it's so, so hot, your off season is the summer because the animals can't be outside very long. Sure. Because they just don't, they don't, it's just like us going outside in extreme yep. heat. You yep. know, it's the same for us. But um, to answer your question, we're doing it in the states from Florida to California in mild climates. And once that's established and with the number of investors that, involve, that are involved, there might be one in Florida and another in another country with a mild climate before there's one in another state based on who's backing it and how much of a team we have uh -huh. to develop those properties. Uh -huh. But once that's, you know, the model is pretty well, and we're also working with, I found out we mirror the Genius U resort model with Roger James Hamilton. Oh. Uh, Gen G yeah, they have a new educational IPO that they're bringing out in the fall but they're really about maximizing human potential. They're global citizens. We're part of a network that does investments that you know, actually fund these kinds of initiatives, um, but they have their own physical models where they have a Genius Central, a Genius Cafe, and a Genius Resort that are already in existence mm -hmm. in Singapore and in Bali. Um, they have a couple of, um, they're, they're like safari game retreats, but there's no hunting done on them, but they're like animal reserves, a couple of them. Right. And so now they're making them available to be licensed out. And we'll be doing, I expect we'll be doing a couple of those as well, but on the surface, it looks the same, but they mm -hmm. have a plan to launch so many in each region of the world at different times and ours can scale even faster, but they will look and feel very much the same. Well, that but, is very interesting. Yeah, and so our model can be licensed out for people that want to live in a place with four seasons. I grew up in a place with four seasons mm -hmm. and I love, you know, having the winter and some seniors don't want to live in a warm climate all the time. Yeah. And this model can in fact be adapted to another season, you know, other seasons, but they'll have different owners. It will maybe not be part of the fund, but it will definitely be licensed and an income stream for the fund members. 
but it will have its own independent operators. Hmm. I'm really interested in hearing more about this. Um, I think we're at the end of our time for today, but this is pretty fascinating because there's been, I, I think in the US certainly, there is um, not enough focus given to seniors and senior living and taking care of, um, of seniors. And those coming up behind the seniors who are in their 50s now, they're going to be looking for something a little bit more active and involved. And, you know, they, they don't want it just the same as we wouldn't. I mean, I, 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 I was going to say, I don't mind the winter in the snow, but then I don't do the shoveling. So that doesn't count, I guess. Um, but the heat and humidity and all that. I, I, I just see such an opportunity for this to be a long, I mean, scaling project that attracts seniors and, and people coming up onto being seniors. And I don't know, I don't know if young people today are looking to re retire early the way we did. Our parents, my dad retired at 55. I mean, I'm sort of retired, but I still work. Um, and I think that what, what happens is when you have something wonderful in a place like, like you're talking about with the sanctuary, you don't have to retire, right? Yeah. The seniors are, I mean, the active seniors are going to be, I have to say this, they're, the woman that ran the Boston Marathon when she was like, back, and they tried to take her out of it, yeah. she just ran another one and she was 70 years old. Mm -hmm. I mean, my, the seniors that are going to be on these properties, I mean, it's not, it's it's a little industry of, of itself, resort senior living. It's like you're on, you live in a vacation environment. You just right. live in a resort, basically. But they, they come with their own knowledge, with their own talents, with their own skills, yes. with a guest artist for art, to have an art workshop. You bring in the teacher, but they collaborate. They either learn from each other or you've got an artist that is a senior that mm -hmm. becomes a teacher for a professional development forum because, mm -hmm. you know, it's a golden girls kind of situation that's not limited to women, mm -hmm. but they have, they're, they're accomplished themselves. They just choose to be in a co-living environment right. because that's a personal choice but they're certainly not done. They get involved in the gardening, in the ag tech, in the agriculture, in the keeping of the grounds if they want to, mm -hmm. um, to do whatever they want to contribute to the community, either, either within their own, where they live with the other seniors, or there's a cooperation between how they contribute their talents, they, how they work with the young people, the interns, they learn from each other. Um, yep. There's just so many possibilities. Yeah, I agree. I agree. And, and we're not going to cover them all today. Um, <laughs> but I'm glad that we got to talk about this because this was I was really interested, interested in hearing more precisely because we're in a place in the world and certainly in the US where change needs to happen. And as you said, sometimes chaos and crisis creates good change. Sometimes it's necessary to create the change that needs to happen. And human beings, by virtue of the fact that we have a brain and we all have talents, there are enough of us, enough of you, to be able to tap into that and make something new and wonderful um, happen. So I'm going to be, be able to share this with everyone. So. Um, Jay, I've got all of your links and I will be sharing them on the blog post, but just if someone is interested and thinks this is wonderful and really wants to connect, what should they do? They can reach me by email. Um, it's uh, havenpartnersgroup at gmail.com. Okay. I'm on LinkedIn uh, as Jay Miller Official. I've got a Facebook page of uh, what inspired all of this was my grandfather's legacy and that's Grandpa's Angels Home Solutions, but also Haven Partners Group has its own Facebook page as well. Well, we will be sharing all of that and um, ways for you to connect with Jay about this wonderful, wonderful idea. And 
Um, I'm going to stay in touch. I get your newsletter, but I'm I'm hoping to hear more about this and how it's going. Well, I appreciate your support and the collaboration of your community is only going to make this all stronger and move faster and save more lives. I agree. I agree. So Jay Miller, thank you for being on Smart Conversations. Thank you, Yvonne. I really appreciate it. This is Yvonne DeVita signing off. And guess what? It's not raining yet in Binghamton. See you next time, everyone. <laughs>